Uh, we're going to be launching a series today called Power in the Name. Turn to your neighbor and say, Power in the Name. How many of you know there's power in the name of God? There's power in His name. And what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks and really throughout this summer is we're going to be looking at some different names of God. We're going to be looking at some different characteristics and qualities of God. And I'm excited because what it's going to do as we walk through this summer is we're going to see some stories from the Old Testament that show and reveal God's character to us. And these characteristics, these qualities make it very practical to us today who our God is because it's still very relevant. There is power in the name of God. And sometimes we'll say things like, God loves me, God's there, God's got me. You know, we'll say things, but if we're not careful at times, it can become something that is just monotonous or that can be vague as we call out to God. But what we're going to do is we're going to break it down. We're going to look at these different characteristics. We're going to look at these different qualities. Uh, and we're going to look specifically at the name of Jehovah. Everyone say Jehovah. The name for God in the Old Testament, Jehovah, is the Latinization of the word Yahweh, meaning I am the beginning and the end, the one and only God. In other words, Jehovah, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the always has been. You guys understand. So typically, when God reveals himself to someone and throughout Scripture, when God would reveal himself to different characters in the Bible, he ties the name to, of Jehovah, the, the always has been, the I am, the beginning, the end, the one and only God. He ties that name, Jehovah, to another name that reveals something deeper about him. And so we know that he's Jehovah. He's the beginning, the end, the I am. We know that, right? But he'll tie different names to that to give more specific qualities and characteristics as he's revealing himself throughout scripture. These are known as compound names, compound description names. God uses them to reveal himself personally to give us a greater understanding of who he is. So he's Jehovah. And today we're going to talk about Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Now, this one is probably something that many of you, this is a name that many of you uh, quote, you, you stand on, you'll, you'll bring up. I mean, Jehovah Jireh, it's pretty common. And, and we're going to look at this today. What does Jireh mean? Jireh means to see, to inspect, to perceive, to provide, to consider. And so today we're going to talk about Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, the God who will see to it. Charles Spurgeon said this, he's the God who will see to it when talking about Jehovah Jireh. There is power in the name of God. What I want to do this morning is we're going to look in Genesis and we're going to look at the story of Abraham and Isaac. And we've heard this story before. It's a common story. We're going to look at God fulfilling a promise that had been given. You know, Abraham was 75 years old when God first gives him the promise that his descendants would number the stars in the sky. And so I'm not going to go looking around the room today, but at 75 years old, many of you may be able to resonate with that, many of you not, but at 75 years old, God tells this man, hey, you're gonna, your descendants will multiply. You're going to be a man with many descendants. And can you imagine at that age, I'm, I'm 33, and that would be scary news for me to receive right now because my wife and I, we've, we've had kids and we're just kind of, you know, we're, we're moving on in a different season, right? Everyone said amen. But Abraham was 75 years old when God first gives him this promise. And we know the backstory of that is that Abraham didn't want to wait on the promise. And so Abraham ended up sleeping with a servant named Haggai. And in that moment, they had a son named Ishmael. And we know that as we look at that story, uh, it, it, you know, that was them stepping outside of God's uh, will and God's plan. Then in Genesis 17, God changes Abraham and Sarah's names to Abraham as the father of multitudes. He goes on to fulfill a promise, and he promises him again in Genesis 17, 4 through 6. He says, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will 
make nations of you and kings will come from you. And so God is promising to him again. He's saying, look, I, I, I've still got a plan for you. Even after Abraham had messed up and tried to do it his own way, Abraham and Sarah had tried to rush it. They tried to do something different. And, and, and God's saying, you know what, Abraham, I've, I'm still going to make you a father of multitudes. How many of you ever sang, maybe in kids' church growing up, if you went to kids' church, you remember that song, Father Abraham had many sons, as many, okay, is that just me? Okay. And so, yeah, and we did the motions and like, but that, that's Abraham, right? God was telling him like, you're going to be a father of many nations, of, of multitudes. And so what I want to do today is we're going to look, we're going to pick up on this promise. God had ultimately, we know that God ended up giving uh, Abraham and Sarah Isaac. And let's look in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 through 2. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 22 today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. In Genesis 22, it says this, God said to him, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. How many of you know this is a scary moment? I mean, if this was the word that you received from the Lord, it's not something that would be well received, you know. But in this moment, it was a huge deal because Abraham must have felt like he was finally in a place of rest. He had received this promise from God, this son, this inheritance, and he knew that he had the promise of being the father of many nations, the father of multitudes. And so this was a big moment because at this time, Isaac was Abraham's dream come true. The prayer that, I, that Abraham and Sarah had prayed for had finally come to pass in this moment. And as Abraham is in the middle of this miracle season, the, the, the fulfillment of the promise, this literal miracle, Isaac had been the promise, the long-awaited gift from God, and now God was asking for him back. And that would be a tough thing for any of us to realize because how many of you have ever been waiting on a promise from God and when that promise finally comes to pass or you've finally seen God's hand at work in your life, we have those moments whenever we, we, we see the promise and we say, you know what, now this is mine. We own it. And can you imagine God, and maybe you can relate with something personal in your life, but something God has did and then he comes back and you hear it and it comes across, I'm going to take this back. See, Isaac was the promise, the gift from God. The fulfillment of that promise of becoming a great nation rested on this one and only son, Isaac. And so it wasn't just about Abraham losing Isaac, his son. It was about Abraham realizing that if he lost Isaac, the dream and the promises of God, those two would die off. And so he's trying to figure out, Abraham is in this moment and he's trying to figure out like, what is going on? What is your plan? You know, where are you taking me? And I want to ask you this question this morning. It's this, have God's requests in your life ever seemed to contradict his promises for your life? Have his requests for your life ever seemed to contradict his promises for your life. What do I mean by that? Well, there's sometimes whenever God will take us through seasons and will endure different hardships and we don't understand when we're walking through them because all we've heard is the promise that he's given us before. And so it can seem at times as we think about this, what happens when what God has promised to do through me doesn't match when what, what God is allowing to happen to me. What do I do whenever what God has promised to me doesn't line up with what is happening to me right now? In other words, God, you've given me this promise. Why are you allowing this season before I see the promise, before I get to the finish line, before the revelation, you know, that takes place of the promise? And, you know, I remember a season pastoring in on Alaska uh, before we came here, but it was just out of COVID. So COVID happened 2020, the pandemic, uh, as a pastor, one of the hardest things that, that I've ever endured in ministry is pastoring through the pandemic and keeping the church healthy and whole and just trying to navigate every aspect of that. Um, but 
as we came out of that and we got into 2021, all right, we started to build back some momentum. Our church started seeing growth again. Like it was just a, an exciting time because it was like, yes, like I've missed this. You know, there, there's been so many areas that we've lacked in and I was just thankful that we were in a good season. But I remember in, um, I believe it was in February of uh, 2021, uh, we had, it might have been earlier, it might have been in January, but I'm thinking it was February. But do y'all remember, I don't know if it happened here in southeast New Mexico, but do y'all remember they called it like Snowmageddon in Texas and like everything froze up? Like it was, it was like Ice Age in Texas. Do y'all remember that? Okay. So down in on Alaska, which is further south, it's down by Houston. Like it's a humid place. Uh, you don't ever see snow. Like if you see snow, it's a crazy, crazy thing, right? Like, and you say, well, that's like Hobbes. No, this is, it's a very, very rare thing because it doesn't get that cold there. And so I remember there was a season for like four days where everything froze up. Everything, every pipe in the building froze up. And so everything froze around us. And we're trying to make the, sure that the water was, uh, you know, we, we talked with the water department and they said, hey, keep the thermostats at this degree. Don't close off the pipes completely. And there the pipes are all, in the, the attic, all right? It's all in the attic of the church, not underground. And so it's not insulated or anything like that. And so what happened was whenever that freeze happened, the pipes froze up. And what happened was I was checking on it every day with a friend and we came back and like on the third day, we walked into what felt like, I mean, we, we, I felt like I was walking into the ocean. That's how much water there was in this church. And I remember opening the doors and I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, you know. And I, I'm thinking, okay, Sarah, it's time for us to pack our bags and go. I ain't staying here for this project, you know. Like we got we to gotta rebuild the whole church, you know. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, man. And, and I was so devastated in that moment because I'm like, Lord, you called us here. Like, your hand has been at work. Like, we're seeing salvations. We're seeing signs, miracles, wonders. Like, we're seeing your hand at work. And we're just getting the momentum going again, coming out of this pandemic. And then right as we're gaining that momentum, Lord, you've called us here. You've given us these promises. You've given us these dreams and visions. Right as, as we're getting that momentum again, Lord, you allow the pipes in our attic to freeze. And little did I know in that season, God was working behind the scenes. And I, I could sit down and talk to you for an hour about the blessings that came out of that remodel and the blessings out of what we walked through. And, and, and it was one of those seasons where I knew what God had promised. I knew that God's word was true. I knew that he was faithful. I knew that we would come out on top. But my flesh wanted to say, but here's the reality of where I'm at right now. Can anybody relate to that? Have you ever had a moment or a season where you're, you're pressing on and you're headed somewhere, but you just kind of are like, but here's where I'm at right now. You know, it reminds me, and I've shared this story before, but Sarah and I, we, man, in 2014, we, we had been having trouble conceiving. We had had several miscarriages. And at the beginning of 2014, we fasted and prayed for a baby. And on the 21st day of that fast, when we broke the fast, literally the last day, Sarah received a positive pregnancy test. And that was our first baby, baby Sawyer. And I'll never forget the end of January of 2014 when we received the gift knowing that we would be parents. And I remember in that season that it was like just a sigh of relief because all these promises that we had felt for so long, they had finally, they finally were coming to fruition. The, the, we, we knew that our hearts were to be parents. We felt like God had placed that upon us. We didn't feel like we were not going to be able to have kids our whole life. We just didn't know when. And I'll never forget when that promise came to pass. When that promise came to pass, it was a spiritual moment for us. It was a groundbreaking moment. And in our spiritual journey, we look back and it will forever be a staple and anchor moment of the faith that has been built in our marriage. See, Abraham was in this season where the promise had come, but it was about to be what looked like taken away from him and he didn't know what to do. And when this happens, we have a choice. We have a choice. We can go the human way. We can look at human insight and human rationale, or we walk the path of faith, not sight, and only trusting in God. What do we do? And so, in other words, we, we can have in those moments, in those seasons, we can either depend on God or we can depend on ourselves. 
We depend on God or we depend on ourselves. We, we look at the future through the lens of God's character. We look at the future through the lens of God's perspective, which is hard for us to do because we're, we're humans. But we, we can either look at it through God's perspective and his plans, or we can look through the lens of our own small, finite understanding. What does that mean? It means as humans, we have limited comprehension and understanding. We do not and cannot fathom or understand all of God's glory, splendor, and honor. So what does Abraham do in this moment? Well, let's carry on in the story. In Genesis 22, verse 3, it says this. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Now, remember, God gave him, uh, you know, in the beginning, he had kind of said, like, this place, I'll show you. Had given, a, given him little instruction, but Abraham was still waiting for the details and what would come out of that. And so it says, when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. It's amazing because Abraham immediately obeyed God whenever God told him this. Whenever God started asking this, whenever this stuff started to come out of the, the mouth of the Lord, and he began to speak this stuff to Abraham, what's really incredible, think about this for a moment. I know you've heard messages on this, this story many times, but think about this for a moment. What in the world would go through Abraham's mind for him to immediately obey the way he did? What? That's not normal, and, and I'll tell you why. It's because every time Abraham made a sacrifice for God, the Lord responded by giving Abraham more. Every time that Abraham made a sacrifice for God, the Lord responded by giving Abraham more. What do you mean? Well, when God told Abraham to leave his homeland, God gave him a new one. When God told Abraham to leave his extended family, God gave him a much larger family. When God told Abraham to offer the best of the land to his nephew, Lot, y'all remember that story? God gave him more what? Land. When God told Abraham to give up the king of Sodom's reward, God gave Abraham more wealth. When God told Abraham to give up Ishmael, God preserved him and made Ishmael the father of multitudes. A father of multitudes. Why do we obey even when it doesn't make sense? Abraham did it because he knew that God's tra track record in the past was pure. He, he, he knew that it was 100% on point, that every time God had come through, that every time God was on point and that he came through right when he needed it. Why do we obey even when it doesn't make sense? Because we can look back and understand and recognize. We can look in the Bible and we can look at stories in our own life. We can look back and we can say, my God is faithful. My God is able. My God is bigger. My God is greater. Every time we can look back. Why do I get up every morning and I keep pressing forward and, and not looking back? Why, why do I get up and I keep praying and believing for the, the will and plan that God has for my life? Well, because of God's track record in my life. Because he's always proven himself faithful. And while it's not always happened in the timeline, I've wished it would. He's always come through just in time. And I feel like God is saying to many of us right now in the season we find ourselves and through this story today, what he wants to say to this is this. It's going to be on the screens. Your job is to look back. My job is to look forward. Your job is to look back at his faithfulness. His job is to look forward and cover the future of your life. His job is to look forward. The problem is, is that many of us are forward-seeking people, right? That's a normal thing. We want to see what's next. We want to know what house we're going to own 10 years from now. We want to know the next vehicle we're going to drive. We want to know how we're going to pay the next mortgage payment. We want to know how we're going to, uh, when are we going to meet that Prince Charming? Any single ladies in? No, I'm just kidding. You know, like some of y'all, that's been your prayer, right? But like we, we're going through, when, when is this going to happen? When am I going to see this come to fruition? And here's what God says. He says, you look back and know that I've always come through. I'll do my job. I'll look forward and protect you and walk you through everything I have for you. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, for we walk by faith, not by faith sight. 
Not by faith, not by sight. And, and, and let's illustrate that further going on in Genesis chapter 22, 4 through 5. Abraham didn't know everything or how it would play out. He just obeyed immediately. He knew that God was faithful. And in Genesis 22, verse 4, it says, On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place, Moriah, in the distance. And he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy, Isaac, go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. We will worship and then we will come back to you. In this story, we're witnessing two very important aspects of obedience. You see, there is obedience based on insight from God. In other words, I'll obey you because you are God. You're the authority of my life. I, I have that knowledge and insight. And then there's obedience based on confidence in God. I'll, I'll obey you because you are good and you are the author of all life. It's, it's a confidence in his character or there's insight into his character. See, Abraham's obedience is moving from mere compliance to God to confidence in God. It, it's not just I'm compliant because you are, I'm supposed to because you're the creator of life. I, I'm not just compliant and I'm not just going to go through the motions because this is what we're supposed to do, God. I'm going to go... Fulfill what you're calling me to do. I'm going to take the next step you're asking me to take. I'm going to take that next step of faith. I'm going to plant that next seed. I'm going to sow that next seed. I'm going to do the next thing you're asking me to do, not just because I want to be compliant, but because I am confident in who you are. And I am confident that he who began a good work in me. Come on, somebody. He always finishes what he starts. See, God had a plan with Abraham. And so Abraham's obedience here was not just from a compliance standpoint, not out of obligation, it was confidence. How do we know this? Verse 4 and 5, it, it says, again, we just read it, but it says, we will worship you and we will come back to you. We will worship and we will. So understand this. Abraham knew what had been asked of him. And as he's getting ready to head up there, he says, don't worry, we will come back. So from the very beginning, before the story even started to play out, he said, we will be back together. Abraham's faith, listen to me here, Abraham's faith was at a point where he believed God so much that even if he did go through and, and do what God had asked him to do in the Lord's will was that, even if he did kill Isaac, Abraham's faith was so strong and so great that, I, that Abraham knew that God would bring Isaac back from the dead. He knew that he had raised him back from life. So one way or the other, Abraham knew that we were coming back together with my son. The promise was still going to be intact no matter what was about to happen. You want to talk about a confidence? You want to talk about a faith? Come on, some of us, we're so quick to give up on God whenever we, uh, you know, whenever things just go a little bit wrong on a Monday morning, man. We get some bad news at work or we find out some bad news from the doctor and we're quick to say, man, God, I don't know who you are or where you are or what you're going to do, but you've done messed everything up. Look, 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 we're so quick to play the blame game, but sometimes we just got to sit down for a moment and we got to say, hold on for a second, Satan, you are the father of lies. And these things in my head, they are from man and not from God. Because my God has said that he will pave a way. My God has said that he will provide for my needs. My God has said that he is the miracle worker. My God has said. And so sometimes we got to stop letting our mind race because what happens is we create a narrative and a reality that's not true. We create a narrative and a reality that's based off of human intellect and emotion instead of God intellect and God knowledge and God wisdom. And let me tell you something. Whenever you try to rewrite your story with your own words instead of God's words, it's a very dangerous place. It's a very scary place and you were never intended to be the author of your life. He's called the author of life for a reason. Listen, some of you are trying to write your own book, and he says, hey, I'm, I'm the one writing the story. Drop the pen. 
Some of you are trying to write the closing chapter and you're trying to say, and, and here's what it's going to look like and here's how much money I'm going to have in the bank and here's how happily married I'm going to be and everything's going to be perfect and here's how many kids. You're trying to write out the whole book. You're trying to write the closing chapter in the dream Hollywood story, right? But God says, that's not the way that I'm writing your story. Stop writing the book and let me take control of the pen again. Let me show you what I have promised you. Abraham's faith was at a point where he believed God so much that even if he killed Isaac, that God would bring him back from the dead. What a powerful example of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 through 19 says this. It says, by faith, Abraham at the time of testing offered Isaac back to God. Acting in faith, he was as ready to return the promised son, his only son, as he had been to receive him. And this after he had already been told, your descendant shall come from Isaac. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. Here's something we need to note. A lot of us, we think of Isaac, we think of Abraham and Isaac, we think of this story, and a lot of us picture maybe Isaac as this infant boy, maybe three, maybe four. We see pictures, and, and we see him as a young child-like thing. And, and we'll, 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 we'll read these stories, and we think of it maybe like Abraham carrying him up there. But if you really look at this, and you look at the timeline, and you look at, 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 at uh, the fact that Isaac carried the materials up the mountain, right, that, that most scholars would suggest that he was not a little boy. In fact, he was a young man. He was a teenager. And so it wasn't like he was just picking up this 20-pound, 30-pound little baby and making him do. you, you got to understand, Isaac was also willing to walk up the mountain with his father because he trusted not only God, but Isaac trusted his father Abraham. And together, they would walk up and see the plan that God had. Remember, Isaac didn't know what he was carrying up the, the, the materials for. He didn't know where the sacrifice was. He didn't know what it was going to like. But he kept going because he was going to be obedient. Isaac was willing. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 6 through 8 says this. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. You can imagine that Abraham, under his breath in that moment, is, is Isaac's asking that question. And he's saying, where's, this, where, where's, the, where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? Where's the ram? You can imagine that Abraham was just praying as his son that he loved so much was asking that question. You can just kind of picture Abraham saying, Lord, I know you've been good and I know you've been faithful, but I don't see a lamb. I don't see a ram. I, I don't know what you're supposed to do. I don't know where it's coming from. But, Lord, pr please provide the sacrifice. Please read down. Will your hand intervene in this moment in my life just like you have before? Please, Lord, I'm praying for it. You can imagine that's where Abraham went in that moment. Abraham was putting all faith and confidence in the character of God. Remember, Abraham said, he will provide Jehovah Jireh. See, all they could see is their path up the mountain. All they could think about was what their own eyes could see. All they could think about was what they saw in the flesh, in the carnal side of things, but God had a bigger plan. Let's go on in Genesis 22. In Genesis 22, verse 6 through 8, I'm sorry, verse 9 through 14. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, 
the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Jehovah Jireh at work. Abraham claimed it. He named it. And, and he was reminded in that moment of one of the compound names that we're talking about today. He was reminded in that moment of just how real Jehovah Jireh was. Just how real it was that he was the God of the beginning, the I am, and he is the God who will provide. He was seeing it come to pass in his own life. And we look at this story, we see this story and often think of this dramatic scene where Abraham raises this dagger up and, and just as he's about to go strike down, that the, 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 the Lord grabs the hand. And we look at it as this dramatic scene, but our Lord is not panicked or, or our Lord is not rust. I, I, I think that as, as Abraham started to reach down for that, he started to realize that something was going to happen, that, that, that in that moment, God was looking to see what I, Abraham was looking at. And Abraham wanted to, God wanted to test Abraham's eyes and Abraham was looking around and just in that moment as he was getting ready to do something, Abraham looked out and saw the sacrifice that he had been praying for. He saw the ram. They're climbing up the mountain. Abraham's praying, Lord, provide. Lord, where's the, where's the lamb? Where, where's the offering? Lord, please and they finally get up there and he's about to fulfill and go through with what he had been told to do. But God was looking at Abraham and said, Abraham, open your eyes. The promise is right there. And some of us, when we get in those seasons where we're looking and we're following the instruction and direction of the Lord, we've got to be careful because if we get so busy and we get so distracted by so many different things, if we're not careful, we'll miss out on the very promise that God has placed right in front of us. God says, open your eyes. Open your eyes. I, I got something I want to show you. Some of you right now, you walked into this place this morning. You've been praying for a miracle. You've been believing for a promise, and it's not come to pass. And you've decided, maybe even before you walked through these doors, you said, you know what, I'm giving up. You know, I, I've given up on that dream. I've given up on that promise. I'm not even praying that prayer anymore. I want you to know today that Jehovah Jireh, who was there for Abraham, is still here today. And he still wants to move and work in your life. And so just because you can't see the promise right now, doesn't mean the ram's not getting ready to show up. This was a powerful moment. While they were climbing one side of the mountain with no answer in sight, Jehovah Jireh, God, was sending the answer up the other side of the mountain in the form of a ram. You may be in a situation or a season today where you're going through something that feels like you're just climbing up a mountain. Sacrifice after sacrifice. You're being obedient after obedient. You're just going through and it seems like trial after trial after trial. But I want, you to, I want to tell you this morning that God is Jehovah Jireh. And in his timing, his perfect timing, there will be a ram. In his perfect timing, not in your timing, not in their timing, in his perfect timing, there will be a ram. And that ram may not look the way you thought it was going to look, but he always provides. Amen. Yes. He didn't say, notice Abraham didn't say, the Lord might provide. The Lord might. There's no use of the word might or may. He says the Lord will provide. Maybe, just maybe. We're missing out on the fulfillment of the promises he's given us because in the back of our mind, we're still doubting the whole way walking up the mountain. Abraham didn't doubt for one second. He was obedient. He was going. He was going. He was going. He was going to fulfill every step and command that God gave him. And in that moment, God said, hold on, I'm here. And Abraham knew that God had come through once again. In order to experience God as Jehovah Jireh, 
We have to have faith in him as Jehovah Jireh. That means that we've got to be obedient. We've got to be obedient before we even see the finish line. See, God has been and always will be Jehovah Jireh. Whether we see him as such or not, whether we have a lot or a little, whether we see the finish line or we don't see it, but because of human nature, it takes us getting to the place of all of the control coming out of our hands for us to recognize that the things that we're able to provide will not last. The things that we're able to direct will not stand. But if we allow Jehovah Jireh to orchestrate every detail of our life, he'll provide in a way that we never, ever could or can comprehend or understand. And what's incredible is that not only does God promise to provide our physical needs, he promises to provide for our spiritual needs, our emotional needs. And so I just want to speak to this for a moment Anxiety and depression bow in Jesus' name. Some of you need a breakthrough, and it's not financially this morning. It's not even health uh, from a physical standpoint of uh, something, you know, like, you know, you're not needing help with diabetes or something like that. But maybe you're here this morning, and you're so bound up by anxiety and depression. Man, you're so wound up. You you can't even sleep at night because you're so anxious. Or maybe you're so depressed. You've lost joy for days, and you just don't know where to look. I'm here to tell you today that Jehovah Jireh, the provider, is in this place, and that's not just for money. That's not just for a job. That's not just for a car. That's not just for protection. Come on, somebody. That's also for your joy. That's also for your happiness. That's also for your life of abundance. That's also for peace. He is the provider of peace. The other day I was praying for somebody who lost a loved one in a tragic way. And my prayer for them was this, is Lord, May your angels flood their home in such a way that you provide a supernatural peace that whenever they lay their head down to sleep tonight, there will be a supernatural rest they've not experienced in weeks. He provides not just for our physical needs, but emotionally, spiritually as well. I'm going to take this story a step further. Don't Don't worry, I'm getting ready to close here in just a minute. This story goes so much deeper than just being about Abraham and Isaac. God told Abraham to go to Moriah. Remember this? Do you know what Mount Moriah is? It's Jerusalem. Genesis 22, four through five says, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place Moriah in the, in the distance. And so we can see the parallels between Moriah and Jerusalem when we see the story of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Follow me here. They're riding into Jerusalem on a donkey on their way to sacrifice Abraham's only son. And as Isaac is walking up the mountain, his father places the wood, that wood that will be used for the sacrifice on his shoulders to carry up the mountain. Isaac was a willing sacrifice. Abraham was obedient to the command. Abraham prophesied for this situation But in this moment, he also prophesied for the future that God would provide a lamb for the sacrifice that is needed for all. And at the moment of sacrifice, Isaac changes from being a type of Christ to being us in the story. Isaac changes from just being a representation. It it, it foreshadows what is to come. And God sends a ram, an adult Jesus Christ, lamb, to be, the subs- to be the sacrifice that we need, the once and for all, the lamb of God. Not only that, but it was the angel of the Lord who spoke to Abraham to put the knife down. See, here's what I want to tell you this morning is that Jesus was speaking to Abraham in the Old Testament. He was showing him that a lamb would be provided. He was showing him that there is a way out. But at that same mountain, are you listening this morning? That same mountain that he would be crucified on thousands of years later was that same mountain that Abraham was on making that sacrifice in that moment. And when Abraham made that statement, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Whenever Abraham called upon him and said, the Lord will provide, he was also foreshadowing the fact that the Lord would provide the sacrificial lamb once and for all for us, that he would shed his blood so that we could have salvation and be saved. I want you to know that he's, in a practical sense, Jehovah Jireh. So every day, the things you face, he's, he's Jehovah Jireh. He, 
he's able to provide in the darkest of circumstances, but also in a very spiritual way. He's always been Jehovah Jireh. He's provided the lamb. He gave his one and only son for you and I on the cross so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. So I want you to know that we're not just waiting on him to provide because it's something that he's not done before. If, if you look back and you're like, man, I don't got many stories of provision. If no other story existed in your book, make it be this one, that God sent his one and only son, Jesus, the sacrifice lamb he provided Jehovah Jireh gave his son Jesus to us as a gift so that we would not be destined to hell forever but we would have hope in eternity in heaven instead I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up you see many of us are walking around living life and we're wondering if God will see to it can he see to it Will he see me through it? Is he able to? And I want you to know that confidently, assuredly today, I tell you that Jehovah Jireh will provide. He provided the lamb in the form of Jesus. He provided the ram to Isaac, to Isaac, Isaac and Abraham in this story. He provided the, the ram. I want you to know that just as he came through for them, he's come through for us. And I don't know what you're believing for or praying for in the future. Maybe today it's that you give your life to Jesus, the, the, the lamb that's already been provided. You say, I'm, a, I'm messed up and I need to dedicate my life to him. Or maybe you're in a desperate situation right now and you've heard the promises of God. You've known that they've been there before, but maybe you've given up on a dream. I want you to know that Jehovah Jireh is in this place and he wants to give you the promise. But will you open your eyes? But will you open your eyes? Would you stand with me this morning? I don't know what you walked in here carrying, but I want you to imagine yourself this morning walking in here just as Abraham did with Isaac as they're walking up that mountain and they're carrying all the things. And so, you know, you can imagine the load level would have been heavy. And as they're walking up this mountain together, I want you to think of yourself walking in here as you did this morning. You walked in here maybe carrying things, maybe anxious, maybe unsure. You don't know what the end road was going to look like, but you just... I'm being faithful. I'm coming to church, Lord. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to, I'm going to go sit in that church seat again. Even though week after week after week I've been here, and sometimes I just don't know if you're here. I don't know if you're, you're waiting. I don't know if you're listening. I want you to know today that he's here. I want you to know today that he's ready to show you that he is the God of provision. And you already took the first step. You were obedient and you walked through these doors. You came and you stood in this place. Maybe you even lifted your hands in worship to, today. But as you did that, the Lord said, I'm here and I'm ready to move. But right now, maybe you find yourself and you're wondering, I believe today God's asking us to open our eyes. Open our eyes. He's saying, hey, I've already provided. The sacrifice is already here. Open your eyes and see that I am faithful, pure, and true. Open your eyes. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Can we dim the lights, please, as well? Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, you know what, Pastor? You're talking about the Lamb of God. You're talking about Jesus this morning. And the first, thing's, the first thing is this, is I don't even have a relationship with Jesus this morning. I need to dedicate my life to him. I know that Jehovah Jireh has come into this place. He gave his life for me. And today I need to, I need to dedicate my life to him. If that's you, would you just raise your hand up right where you're at? You'd say, you know what, Pastor, I've kind of been doing things my own way. I've been walking up my own mountain. I see that hand, brother. Anybody else? I see that hand, sister. Anybody else? There are a couple hands up over here. Anybody else? I need to dedicate my life to him. I see this hand. Anybody else? I need to dedicate my life today. I need to rededicate my life. Come on, just a few more seconds. If that's you, just slide your hand up. No one's looking around. Okay, second.
Secondly, maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know what, Pastor? Man, I, I'm in need of something today. Maybe it's a physical touch. Maybe it's a financial need. Maybe it's a dream that you, you've been praying on. A vision God's given you, but you've not seen the fulfillment of the vision yet. And you're like, Pastor, I'm in the middle. I'm in the waiting season. And and I just need the grace of God to sustain me and carry me. I, I, I need to see his provision. I, and I want to proclaim right now that he is faithful and that he will provide just as he did for Abraham. If that's you today and you say, you know what, Pastor, I need Jehovah Jireh in my life right now today. I got a situation. I got a thing. I need Jehovah Jireh. If that's you, would you just slide your hand up? Come on, don't be ashamed. I see that. I see that. I need Jehovah Jireh in my life. I see that. I see that. Anybody else? I see that. I see that. I need Jehovah Jireh to show himself today. You can look up here. Listen, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come down this morning. And as the prayer team comes down, what we're going to do is we're going to do something very special. We're going to open up the altar, and what we're going to do is if you raised your hand just a moment ago and you recognized and you said, you know what? I need Jesus in my life. Listen, there is no greater thing you could ever do, no greater decision you could ever make. And even if you feel like it's been something you've been battling with and struggling with, and this is a moment of complete surrender in just a moment as we begin to worship again, I'm going to invite you to come down and pray with one of these team members. But as you do, as you get here, let them know I'm dedicating my life. I'm rededicating my life to Jesus this morning. Don't be ashamed because there's going to be others walking down and no one will know why you're down here. But man, the Bible says that when one person gives their life to Jesus, all of heaven rejoices. So we rejoice with you today. We celebrate that. But maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I, I just need Jehovah Jireh. Maybe you're in a breaking point. Maybe anxiety fear, depression has you crippled. Maybe there's a financial miracle you've been praying for. Maybe it's something with your health and you would say, I need Jehovah Jireh to provide. I need, I need him to show me the way. I need him to orchestrate this detail in my life. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come down. And as an act of surrender, as Abraham and Isaac walked up that mountain obediently, they had to walk to the promise. In just a moment, I'm going to ask if that's you. I want you to walk as a statement of confidence that he will. I want you to walk up here and I want you to surrender before him. And we're going to pray with you. We're going to believe that he will provide in your situation. Heavenly Father, we thank you today because you're in this place. And we thank you that there's nothing that we're up against that you can't conquer. There's nothing that we're up against that you don't see, that you haven't already seen. There's nothing in this room that catches you by surprise. Lord, so in this moment right now, Lord, as we're about to take a step of faith, as we're about to maybe come up to the altar, we're gonna lift our hands and worship in the, in the seats, whatever that may look like as we're, we're about to enter this time. Father, I just pray that you would reach down into this place, Lord, and you would give dreams again. You would, you would give vision again, Lord. You would give revelation, Lord, that the promises that were Lord, they would still realize that they, they're still planted. They're still there. Lord, the promises you give don't fall away, fade away. They're not in vain just because we haven't seen them fulfilled yet. Lord, I believe you're going you're gonna to show, you're going to reveal. Lord, we declare it when we ask it today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Listen, they're going to start singing. If you dedicated your life to Jesus, come down. If you're looking for Jehovah Jireh as a sign of obedience and surrender today, come down as we worship. If you're not down here in just a moment as we worship, I want you to lift your voice up to heaven, declaring, as, as we said in the sermon, we're looking back on his faithfulness and we're letting him look ahead to the things that will come our way. Let's worship him.
lift your hands today, telling him thanks and giving him praise for what he's already done. Lord, we thank you for your provision and faithfulness in the past. Lord, we know that your promises are true and constant. Lord, we thank you. Lord, because not only can we look back on scripture, but we reflect on our own lives and we see your hand at work through it all. And Lord, today we lift our hands, praising you, thanking you, because your word does not return void, because your promises are eternal. We thank you, Lord. Right now, we're in a good season. Let's not take it for granted. Let's go to war on behalf of our brothers and sisters. One last time, could we sing that together?
right now we consider it done. Lord, and right now we consider it done. Lord, the dreams will come to pass. The promises, God promises will be fulfilled. God visions will see it through. Lord, our, our physical, spiritual, emotion, emotional needs don't catch you by surprise. So we consider it done that Jehovah Jireh will provide. So we call out your name today. And we thank you that the beginning and the end is in this place. But you're also in the middle of our circumstances. And Father, keep our mind and our hearts in check. Lord, as we start to doubt at times, as we start to wonder, as we start to compromise, Father, may we remain unchanged, Lord, rooted firm in the Word of God. Lord, may we stand strong whenever the world throws things our way. Whenever Satan, the father of lies, try to distract and defeat us, we come against it and we say no weapon formed against us will prosper. Jehovah Jireh is at work in this room today. We declare it and consider it done in your precious, mighty name. Amen and amen. You know, when we say amen, we're saying, let it be. So it is. We're, we're declaring that it's finished. Amen is not a wish or a maybe. When we say amen, we're declaring. We're declaring that it is done. I want you to know whatever he spoke to you, whatever he gave you today, whatever you walked in here, and he showed you that it is done in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Man, God bless you so much. Thank you all so much for, for being here, being attentive to his work and his voice. We'll see you guys back here next week. God bless you. Thank you guys for joining us for this week's service. If you ask Jesus to come into your heart or you rededicated your life, we want to know about it. So stay connected with us on our website. You'll see it below the screen. You'll go to connect. You'll go to prayer request, whatever it is that you need. We want to stay connected with you. Fill out the connect card with all your information. We promise not to blow up your, your email with a junk mail or anything like that or call you or send you out mass text. We just want to know your information in case you need us. Um, we are here for you. So we can't wait to see you guys next week. Please join us.